when you're trying to flow through in a service, you always wonder, right, how do you follow the person that comes before you? What's the next thing to say that segues nicely from what's just happened to what we're about to say and where the message is going to take us? And all I can say is, could you turn with me, please, to number 32? Doesn't really get any more exciting than that. If you're wondering why it is that Alfred has just stood up and said uh, the men's group have decided that they would like to have a time of prayer and fasting together, and why it is that we are praying for the church's finances, for people's health, and for things like that. And we'd be clear that when we pray and when we fast, we don't twist God's arm behind his back saying, well, I've done this, God, so you should do that, because that isn't how it works with the Lord. It just isn't. He is a giver of good gifts. He is the provider and he is our all and all and all sufficient one. This is about our dedication to something, not about convincing God to do something because we want him to do something. But I've learned something today. I didn't know that orange juice when you were fasting was bad for your pancreas, so there you go. If you walk away from nothing today, you have walked away with good health advice that will very much help you in that whole progress. And it's really important that we know that. But I need to say this morning, that the message that I have come to share with you is of vital importance. If today English is not your first language and you uh, speak French and you may struggle sometimes to understand what I'm saying, can I ask that you make sure that you've got some of the translation equipment with you because it is vital that you listen to the message that I've got for you today. And if you do want that, just pop your hand up and the team will come and give you those translation things. I don't think anybody does. And it's really important that you give me your attention for the next, let's just pretend it's going to be a few minutes, shall we? Just a few <laughs> minutes that come along. Because uh, we need to talk about where we are as a church, the situation we're in, and to make it clear that we are in a crisis situation. And this morning is a make or break moment. Hence why I need to share that with you. Now, if that is passed by, it feels to me like it has seemingly passed by a lot of people. They're like, R really? Our church is in crisis? I knew nothing. Well, you did. Because these things have been announced now for, for quite some time, over a period of time, since January last year, and nothing has changed. And you know that old Einstein quote, which is, if you continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results, then that is the definition of insanity. Some of us, we've already been told we're not normal. <laughs> but I really don't think any of us are insane. There may be a few of us. But, uh, thank you, son. But let's have a look at Numbers 32. Numbers 32 says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was a place for livestock, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moses, to Eliezer the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, Altron, Dibar, Jazer, Nimra, Heshbon, Eleh, Shabam, Nebo, and Beon, the country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Therefore they said, If we have found grace in your sight, let this land be given to your servants a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war and sit here? Now why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord had given them? Thus your fathers did when I sent them away from Kadesh Barnea to see the land from when they went up to the valley of Eshcol. They saw the land and they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel so they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. So the Lord's anger was aroused on that day. He swore an oath saying, Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt from 20 years old and above shall see the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob because they have not wholly followed me except Caleb, the son of Jephun, the Kenzanite and Joshua, the son of Nun for they have wholly followed the Lord. So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel. He made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord 
was gone. And look, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once again leave them in the wilderness and you will destroy all of these people. Then they came to him and said, we will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will be armed, ready to go before the city of Israel until we have brought them to the place. Our little ones will dwell in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance is fallen to us on the east side of the Jordan. Then Moses said to them, If you do this thing, if you arm yourself before the Lord for war, and all your armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he's driven out his enemies before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then afterward you may return and be blameless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep and go and do what has proceeded out of your mouth. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke to Moses saying, your servants will do as my Lord commands. Amen. One of those things that Northerners are often accused of, if you find yourself as a Northerner, I used to class myself as a Northerner until I moved here. Apparently I'm from the Midlands. <laughs> Only just, I live on the border. They're often accused of not wanting to pay for anything or pay for something. If we can get it for free, we can. And I'll say this, this is my father, my father's story. My father loves to go into shops and look for things, and when he finds something that doesn't have a price tag on it, he picks it up and he shouts out, this one must be for free, there's no price on it. <laughs> and then just to make the point a little bit further, he goes up to the cashier, and he puts it down and he went, can I have this one for free, there's no price on it. And lo and behold, of course, the cashier goes, no, sorry, the price must have fallen off, or we've not put a price on it. And then he goes, of course, it's not free, apparently, but I've not put a price on it. That was the price I wanted to pay for it. Because if we're honest, if we could have anything, free is always the price that we would like to pay for it. Or nothing at all is always the best price for anything. But I don't think that's a northern thing. I think that's a human thing. Who wants to pay for something if they can get it for free? It's like, um, I don't know if you've got a computer at home. I have. And it keeps coming up, mine does, and it keeps telling me that I need to reset it and start all my virus checkers. So I do that. I turn it off, and it comes on, and it's uploaded all the virus checkers. And then it tells me that for 30 days, I can have it for free. But if I enter my credit card details, I can have it for this price for the 150 days after that. Well, I always go for the 330 days and then go look for another virus checker that I can get for another 30 days for free. I've probably got about 50 virus checkers loaded up on my computer, which is why it takes 10 minutes to load, because they're all competing with one another to see if there's anything on my computer that shouldn't be. We like things that are free. It's the right price for all of us. It's the right price we like to pay for anything. And if when we imagine the kingdom of heaven and we think about going to heaven and going to glory and when we get to Jesus, then the one thing that probably is universal in everybody's mind in this room is we won't have to go to work and buy things. There's no going to be going to work to earn money so I have to go and buy certain things because we're fairly certain that everything in heaven will be free. That there will be no shops, there will be no credit, and there will be no debt, and there will be none of that at all. Now, whether that's true or not, we are not in that kingdom right now. So we do things, and things cost money. Things cost. Everything has a cost. Some things we're happy to spend money on. 
and other things we spend money on as begrudgingly as we can. And we fight tooth and nail to make sure we don't pay any more than we have to pay on that particular item. There's a story of a, a woman who saw a man selling a dozen eggs. And the man who was selling these eggs, he was on the street, he'd got a basket of eggs on like Alan and Liz, who've got them for free. They were selling them off. And this woman walks out, she sees him, and he's got the price up there. It's £1.50 for a, a dozen eggs. She comes up, she says, I'm not willing to pay any more than 75 pence. 75 pence is the price that all I am willing to pay for those eggs. The man hadn't sold any eggs all day, so he said, you know what? Something's better than nothing, that's perfectly fine. She bought a dozen eggs off him for 75 pence. She was very pleased with herself. She got in a taxi to go and see her friends and as the taxi arrived at the restaurant where she was eating, she tipped the driver five pounds because he'd taken and got her there exactly the time that she wanted to. She met her friends in the restaurant and she told them about this amazing deal that she'd got on a dozen eggs and then tipped the waiter for bringing their meals on time and everything that came to her. Now, if you've seen that story before, you think, you haven't made that up. I've seen that on Facebook. Ah, Facebook giveth and it taketh away. But there are many things that we can pull off that. And of course, that's usually on one of these websites that talk about the inequality of this world. Guess what? This world has inequality in it. You'll never find justice in it. But keep gnawing at that bone. I'm sure it'll keep you happy. There is no justice to be found in this world. There's only justice to be found in the kingdom of heaven. However, I'm not telling you that story because I want you to hate the idea that we should all be about money. It's all about there are things that we want to pay for and we're willing to pay for. And there are things that we don't want to pay for and we're not willing to pay a penny more than we have to. Who looks to pay more on their car insurance? Who puts their details in confused.com and then goes down to the 10th one on, this, on the, the list and says, I'm going to pick that one. It's 700 pounds more than the best one, but I like their logo. Or I might get a meerkat. You get the meerkat anyway. Who wants to do that with electricity? It's been like my dad. Whenever we turned the light on, just our light on. Is it Blackpool in here? Where are all the lights on? Who wants to spend more on electricity bills? But we might on clothes that we like. We might be happy to go and spend that little bit extra on something that is made by somebody that we think has made it better. Or food. We're not so willing to keep going to Asda and buying the smart price, the white packet stuff, because we know there's no taste in that. And, you know, I have a personal rule that cheap bread and cheap butter are two things that I will not go anywhere near, because yeah, I'm getting an amen from the back. <laughs> Who wants to do that? Who wants to go for the cheapest holiday? It's... Two weeks that we might be taking off somewhere and we want it to be a nice holiday. So we're willing to pay a little bit more because we get the few extras that come with it. And of course, in my case, it's good takeaways. Never risk a bad takeaway. It's always a regret. And this isn't an anti-money message and it's not an anti-possession message. I shared this with the teens and I say the same thing with you. The things that we own, the things that we have, the things that we love to purchase, the things that we've got at home, we're not like the old Puritans who said, get rid of everything and just wear the black hat with a buckle. Because when we love something, it really helps us to gauge where our relationship with the Lord is. That comes to human relationships, animal relationships, and relationships with possessions, houses, and things that we've got. When we've got that and we understand, actually, I really love that thing that I have, I think in my son's case, I really love my PC. I think the worst thing that could ever happen to him is if somebody came and took that away from him. He would weep for days. There'd be no consoling him. But then because I know that I love that, 
how much do I love the Lord? I can gauge it. I now have a response. I know I love this item. Now I know if I love the Lord and whether I would be as willing to do for the Lord what I am for that person, that item, that pet, whatever it be, it helps to gauge things. Only things help us to understand where our relationship with the Lord is. My point is, there are always things we don't like to pay for. There are always things we don't like to pay for. But we are aware that all things have a cost. They're all necessary to life, or we wouldn't pay for them at all. So what about the things that aren't necessary? Or the things that don't give us anything back? What about the things that don't in any way affect your life? How much are you willing to pay for them? In Numbers 32, if you're unsure of the, the story here, the narrative that's going on in the book of Numbers, the children of Israel having left Egypt 40 years earlier, and having rejected to go into the promised land, having rejected God, they were told that they would wander around the, the salt deserts for 40 years until that entire generation, aged 20 years and over, passed away. And the new generation that grew up would then inherit the land that we call today Israel, the promised land they would cross over the Jordan, into that land. And having done their wandering and having gone through all of the things, which is a real insignificant part of the whole scripture, 40 years is only covered by two kind of ish events. One where a guy goes and picks uh, pieces of wood up on the Sabbath. And another one where a rebellion is started by a man named Korah who believed that he should be having his milk and honey right now, right today. Not when I get to glory, not when the Lord calls me, I want my good stuff now. And he found that he was completely not in the will of God at all. But that's all that you hear. Imagine 40 years of your life being nothing more than two stories. One of the scariest verses I find in the Bible is in the book of Acts. It says, and Paul was in prison for two years. I hate that line. I hate the idea that that could be true. At one point in your life, that the only sum up of your line is a sentence that's got no more than five words in it. And if your life could be summed up in a sentence with five, then you need to start finding that will of God that he's got for you. Because you were called for more than that. And it wasn't that Paul was out of the will of God. He was in the will of God being in that prison. Because then we read more about that in time where he got to share his testimony. And that was taking him on the road that God was taking him with. But here, with the children of Israel, they were now about to cross. And in about to, they had taken some land already. It wasn't their land. It wasn't the land that was promised for them. It was the land that Lot had turned to Abraham and said, I'll have that land. And then Lot's descendants had lost that land. And Israel took it back and they liked where they were. Why should we cross over? So the question that came to me when I read Numbers 32 is, why did Moses tell them off, wanted to stay where they were, if later God would say it was okay for them to stay where they were? Why would God tell them off, or Moses tell them off, for saying you're rejecting your inheritance like those people did 40 years earlier when God said, actually, this is part of your inheritance? One of the things that we forget, often forget, is when the Lord took Abraham and got him to walk all around the promised land and said, this land will be given, not to you, not to your kids, but to your descendants. He walked from the Mediterranean and the next river is the Jordan. And that's the border today even of where modern Israel is. Modern Israel doesn't fit anywhere near the space that ancient Israel did. But that's not where Abraham was stopped. He kept walking. He kept walking to the next river. And the next river was the river Euphrates. 
And the river Euphrates is in the middle of today, modern Iraq, where they're doing all of this fighting and battling and all of those areas. And that's what God said to Abraham would be the land given to your descendants. And never, never in history to this day of Israel ever got that far. Because he gave them the start and their plan was to grow out. But of course they didn't. They contracted until they got back to just one city. And even now it's still just about that one city. But God had called them in to inherit an entire land. So why was Moses angry at them if they were doing what God had always intended? What God had already told Abraham 400 years previous to that? And the question actually answered itself. It was part of their inheritance. They could have it as a possession. So we have to conclude something. When they asked, can we stay on this side of the Jordan while everybody else crosses, their motives were wrong. In fact, we know it must be really bad because Moses describes that what they want to do is not just as bad as those people who said to the Lord in Numbers 14, we don't want to go into the promised land. We don't want what you've got for us, God. We want our own thing. Moses says it's worse than that. It's worse than rejecting God, what you were doing. It's found in the way that they make their request and Moses' initial reaction all found in verses 5 to 7. They say this phrase, if we have found grace in your sight, then please don't make us do the same thing. Don't bring us over the Jordan. It's clear by what Moses' reaction is they meant their whole nations, their whole clans. We don't want to go. Don't make us go. Let us stay here. We like this land. We've got lots of livestock, lots of cows. We can worship God here. We've got everything we need to be able to worship God. We've got the, the sheep. We've got the cows. We've got the bullocks. We've got the goats. We don't need anything else. We don't need that promised land. We've got it all here, and that's enough. Don't take us over. We'll stay here in this good land and we will give you our best wishes and pray that the Lord bless you in your endeavor. In other words, although the place that they were in was part of what God had got for them, part of their possession that they could have as part of their inheritance, they weren't looking at it as part of what God had given them. They were looking at the good that they'd got and they didn't want to not have that. Where they were was good. It was fertile land. They had the livestock. They could worship the Lord in peace. They were in peace. They'd been able to take it and destroy giants and take this land. It had cities. It had everything. It had all the goodness that they had been fighting their entire lives to get. 40 years of wandering around the wilderness and now they weren't living in tents anymore. They had fields, and they had livestock, and they had everything, and I don't want to go back to that life again. They didn't want the strife, and they didn't want to invite it on themselves. So Moses came back to them. You intend on sitting here on your backsides whilst your brothers go and fight. And then he reminds Reuben of something. You didn't get to where you are on your own, Reuben. The rest of them were with you when this land was taken in the first place. You didn't get here on your own. You didn't get here on your own. Everybody else helped you to get here. And now you don't want to help everybody else to get where they need to go. You're happy where you are. 
have you taken the land yourself? And of course the answer is no. They had been helped by others to come to this place. So what we see is they were indifferent to the needs of their brothers. And they were loveless in their actions. We are told to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That is the summing up of the whole of the law. It's as simple as that. And in 1 John, it goes further to say that if you see your brother in need, and you have the ability to meet that need, and you store up those goods, then how can you say that the love of God is within you? Have we found grace in your sight? Means. Well, we all know what grace means. Grace means unmerited favor. Something I don't deserve, but it's poured upon me. The grace of God that is poured upon us is wonderful. So what they're actually asking Moses to do is to sanctify their decision-making process. They have made a choice. We're not going to do anything. Now will you bless that? Will you please bless our desire to sit on our backside and send out good vibes? Wish the goodness out there. A bold endeavor to sit on their backsides and enjoy the fruits of God whilst others go and fight. Now we can learn much from this idea. We live under grace, not the law. We therefore have a choice in all that we do. We have a choice if we should go and fight. We have a choice if we should be involved in the kingdom of heaven. We have a choice if we should be involved in the things that God has called us to. But we know, because this is what our church stands for, of our most prized beliefs in all things is that we believe that every person has been called to find that good work within them to do it and to do it better. We believe that that was the purpose that not just you were created for, but everybody in this world was created for, wherever they live. Whether they live in Timbuktu, whether they live in North Korea, whether they live in Saudi Arabia, whether they live in the United States of America, wherever they live, God created them for a purpose. And that purpose was to be a part of his body. And you miss any parts of your body, then you know it. And you know about it. But grace being grace, we've accepted Jesus as Savior and we can easily say, I now have my inheritance. I'm done. I now have salvation. I'm done. I have no intention of going any further because everything from now on, as far as I'm concerned, is optional. And I've gone as far as I will go. And when we look at this, we'll see Reuben and Gad really didn't actually have a choice. They were told these very th clear things. You will have to go and fight in the promised land or you will lose everything. Many Christians have been taught wrong. If you're new to Christianity, then probably all you know is that you accepted Christ Jesus as your saviour. If you've been in Christianity a long time, you've probably heard fra phrases thrown around like the words Calvinism and Arminianism. And if you're going, I have no idea where those two places are. One of them, I believe, is near Turkey. No, they're not. They're two theologians who, in the 16th century, 400 plus years ago, came out with arguments about how they thought salvation worked. And because of that, the church has been forever debating these two things. Because of what happened, because we had this... Catholic Protestant split because we found that salvation is by grace and not by works that when they came they didn't throw all the right things out but they did throw some of the wrong things out and so the church has been so adamant to prove that you don't have to do anything to earn your salvation it's left people doing nothing 
And let's just get rid of that argument altogether because they're both wrong. And at the same time, they're both partially right. Oh, that's going to freak you out, isn't it? Now, you want to know more about that? You could talk to me after. We're not going into Calvinism and Arminianism right now. But we have been taught wrong. We think that finding that good work within us is an option. It's for the younger generation. It's for others. It's for the preachers. It's for the worship people. It's for the extroverts. But that's not true. If I were to do a little experiment now here in the church and ask people to stand up if they're involved in any activity or they're running activity, almost everybody in the room would be stood up. One of the things I'm most proud about of our church, and believe me, I am ecstatically proud of you all, and you have no idea how much I am. Because you only have to look at our notices and see how active we are. No, activity doesn't mean life. But when you see the passion that comes in those things, and where those activity leaders and activity helpers go, they go further than just running a meeting. They go off and do research. They go and buy books. They put their own effort into it. They take their own time out. They drive and go into prison. They do all kinds of different things that do, and you hear all of these Elements that go on throughout the church, even those of you that help you preach the preparation, the time, and all of that that goes in, whilst you may be working, whilst you may have a job, where you have children, you've got bills to pay, and in all. Even this morning, our worship, every element of it, the people who dedicate that time to the Lord. We are not a church that is struggling with people who are finding that good work in. And three years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. But it is now. Do you know that our, and I've said this, I keep saying it, our young people's department now can take a child, and this sounds a bit conveyor beltish, so I apologize, we're talking about human beings here, not building boxes, but potentially you can take a child from the day that they are born, and we have meetings for them that can take them all the way to the age of 18. And they're not just meetings for them to go and enjoy, they're meetings that are designed for them to not just find the Lord a saviour, but to grow in a knowledge of who the Lord is, build a relationship up with him, find that good within them, and do them. And I can prove that because our teams group now, universally, every single one of them in there runs an activity. The youngest one is 15. The eldest one is 22. They're all actively involved in the church. And if you'd have seen them three years ago, they'd have been saying things that you shouldn't tell their mother. I know nothing. <laughs> That's the thing. We have changed quite a lot as a church. My apologies. A great deal. A great deal. I'm hoping I don't fall over now. That's well done. <laughs> Nobody heard nothing. See, we've been taught wrong in many things. We have to find that good work that's within us, and we have to do it. But we also have to understand that when God has called us to an organization, to a church, to a part, then we're all a part of that because we're a body. In many churches, they're one where the, the minister almost is the tip of. And whether they do it like that or they do it like that, it doesn't matter, it's still the tip of. We have created here a structure that means that that is not just not the case here, it's not the case anywhere. That every person within the church really genuinely is in an equal position 
We all have different elements and different callings, and like a body, we work together all for the same ends. And the person who genuinely is our decision maker is Jesus, because we believe in inspiration of the Holy Spirit and giving you the option to work in that. But that comes then to the cost of everything. We are called to do something with our salvation. Our inheritance is by grace, not by works. Because here's the thing about those children of Israel, the ones that crossed over the Jordan and actually got to in take their inheritance. If you carry on reading the Bible after that point, you'll find they were no better than the generation of people that passed out in the wilderness. So why do they get to inherit had they become perfect, and we come back to this Christian perfectionism, these silly ideas that people have got. It wasn't a matter of losing inheritance. It was found that they're in their willingness to serve. Their inheritance came because they were found in the census. And your salvation will come because you were found in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Lamb's Book of Life, your name only goes in there when you accept Christ Jesus as your Savior. When you make him your Lord. And when you make him your Lord, then he is your Savior. And if he is your Savior, then you will be found in that book. And on that day, your inheritance will be secure. But if you constantly refuse to work for the kingdom, and it isn't an option not to, then you break a great number of scriptures which teach us that we are here to love one another. Not just ourselves. In fact, not ourselves at all. We're here to serve one another. That phrase, that God helps those who help themselves the most, is nonsense. God helps those who help others. And we are here to encourage one another and to be a body in action. This gang's request and the manner of it caused Moses to issue them a very stark warning. The warning was what happened in 14, in Numbers 14, and he started to bring back elements of that that pointed to the fact that these were people who had tasted the fruit and then denied God. His line wasn't that your inheritance will be taken off him, your line was this. That if you keep walking down this road, if you keep walking down that road of selfishness, if you keep walking down that road of, as long as I'm all right, Jack, if you keep going down all of those elements, the next place that you will go is the door. Why? Because this life is full of strife. And if you're only happy if God makes your life an endless summer, he won't. And the minute it isn't, you'll be gone. Why did God call us to be a body? Why did God call a church at all? Why does he not take us to himself the minute we accept Jesus as Savior? Why does he allow us to continue on this earth? Because we're here for one another. So that we can go together. In the 100 meters dash, the person to the left and right of them means nothing. Their eyes are focused. In the 400 meters, they tend to have a pace setter, somebody who's been agreed that they're going to keep the speed, but everybody runs behind it. That pace setter has sacrificed themselves for the whole. But when it comes to that last 200 meters, it's every man for himself. When you get to the London Marathon and somebody decides to run the whole thing dressed as a hippopotamus, a decision they greatly regret after three miles. <laughs> With 20 more to go. Nobody's running that with the intention of beating the guy next to them. They're going together. They carry each other. They pay set for one another. They strengthen one another. That's why God calls us to fellowship together. Even though we're such a diverse church from so many different situations and background God calls us to understand that we are here together 
So this is the danger, you see, of this kind of attitude. And Moses makes it clear. All of Israel will pay for what you decide to do today, Reuben. Well, that doesn't seem very fair, Lord. Why will they all perish? Why should they all perish because of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh's decisions? Why should they all perish? Now, it's not like if you're a parent, you do this. You go in and you say to your kids, you're all grounded now. Punish them all for the one in the hope that they all get a little bit of understanding. And my dad said, here's a slap on account. I know you're going to do something wrong today. <laughs> He's pointing to this. In action. What in action will do? In action will break other people's hearts. Because it's as simple as this. You see it in the workplace. If you've ever been in a workplace, particularly if you do manual labor. That one guy who shirks. Well, if he can do it, I'm going to do it. And if those two guys are doing it, then we're going to do it. Until soon. Everybody's doing it. And it's just the way it is. It's just the way it goes. That's the culture of the work environment. It's the case. The inaction will destroy us all. And in this case, our inaction will bring us to this situation. Because if you can get away with it, why can't other people? Reaching the promised land is not reached by those with a life of sitting on their backsides and doing nothing. And let's just be clear, turning up is an action. That's getting fed. But here's the good news about this chapter. Because Reuben heard all of that. And now they did something that takes them above and beyond. They reacted rightly. If I do this, then my other brothers and sisters will suffer. So therefore, I'm going to change. But here's his change. We're going to go into the promised land that we get no inheritance. We're going to go and fight those enemies and some of our men may die. And we're getting none of it. We're not getting any of the gold. We're not getting any of the silver. We're not, I thought that went then. We're not getting any of the properties. We're getting nothing but we're still going to go and fight. It's something that I don't get, but I'm still going to pay the cost for. It's something that doesn't come to me, but I'm going to pay the cost for. Today, as a church, we employ Daniel Talbot eight hours a week to go into high schools, in primary schools in this town. That does not put food on your table. That does not make your TV work better. That does not give you any satisfaction or enjoyment. But we as a body pay for that whole work to be done. This is the understanding of where churches are. When it comes to preaching about finance, I struggle with this immensely. And part of the reason that we're in this issue is because I don't preach about finance. Many of you have probably been to churches where the offering is not just taken. There's a 20-minute sermon about the offering. It's longer than the sermon. There are promises that if you put in the bag, then you're going to get back. Double, triple, tenfold, hundredfold, thousandfold. You're not going to be able to move for the swimming of blessings that you're going to be in. But Korah was a liar. And he was wrong. Wealth and riches won't make you happy. Although you might say, curse me with it, Lord. Curse me with it. <laughs> it's not about that promise. Because I don't want to talk to you about the idea that if you give, you get, you're not. This is the understanding. If we're a body, like Reuben was part of 12 tribes, 
like God was part of 12 tribes. And if we've all been called to go on the same journey, and we're all called to encourage one another, to build on one another, to do the various works that God has called us to do, that we might be him to everybody inside and outside of the church, then the other element that that comes to is, this is one of those bills that we have to meet. Now you can look at it two ways. You can look at it as it's a bill you don't want to meet, and so you're prepared to pay as little as you can get away with. <laughs> like a busker on the street. You walk past them, and you throw a couple of pounds in, and you think you're being very generous. And in a sense, you are. Because all the guys really do it is playing the guitar on the street. You might want to shout at him, go get a real job. So you throw a few pounds in. And you walk away and you feel very good about that. Ultimately, you've earned your money. Why should he have your money? You've worked for it. And often that attitude comes along in church quite a lot. There are people who think that their tithes and offerings is like paying your taxes to God. Therefore, like I pay my taxes, I have my right to have my say. Well, you have your right to have your say anyway. If you think withholding your tithe is you having your say, you're daft. And it's not me you're going to have the conversation with. You're not withholding them from me. You're withholding them from God. Good luck with that. Because it will not go well. This is the answer we have to understand. We are in a crisis as a church because we are not meeting our bills. That is not because we dine on caviar and champagne. After this service, you go and enjoy the tea and coffee. It wasn't bought by the church. You enjoy biscuits that weren't bought by the church. They were bought by people in the church. Because we buy these things for one another. We support one another. We're here to encourage one another. Now here's the good thing, is this isn't a dying church. Five years ago it was a dying church. But now it's a very alive church. And we're about to move from being what would be considered a small church to be what's considered a medium-sized church. Now it's not me making that definition. That definition, unfortunately, is made by companies that we have to pay bills to. Who define on congregation size as to how much we pay for things like our CCLI license, which means we can play the worship songs because the people who write them want their penny. So we have to buy a license that allows us to do that, and that license is based on the size of the people that come. So bear, it's, it's a surprising, but the more people that come to our church, the more expensive it is to run the church. The more meetings that we run, the more times the gas and the electricity have to be on in our church. The more meetings we run, the more resources we need to buy for those things that are in. So what's the plan? Do we get rid of everything? Our income as a church is £44,000. Our outgoing is £56,000 thousand pounds we have stripped everything that we can back and we have fifty six thousand pounds is the basic running cost of this church and i need to say that as simply as i can to you you can't go to your electricity board and say i'm just going to give you a tenner this week this is the cost of your electricity and you must meet it or they will send a bailiff round we will not be because we can't because we wouldn't this is the church it's not my church. It's not the board's church. It's our church. And we meet these needs together. We meet these costs together. And our missing amount is £12,000, which if you are a stupid mathematician like myself, you'll figure out that that's £1,000 a month. If you take to the idea that there's roughly 40 adults in this room, that works out at £25 extra a month. Sometimes the reason we're in crisis is because you don't know that there's a crisis. And so the opportunity has to be given to everybody to say, look friends, this is the cost of running our church. Now for those of you wondering, this is not about my salary or whether I get paid or not. 
The reason that I have decided to take the cut and salary is because I don't want anybody else to. I don't want any meetings to stop. I don't want any of the other bills that we have not be paid. I don't want us to not have a CCLI license so we can't worship. I don't want us not to have a photocopier so we can't produce leaflets and posters and things that we can hand out and invite people to, some of which many of you are in this room because those things happened. So I'm willing to take, and in this case, no salary, 15 hours a week, uh, a month. And if that's what needs to happen, then I have willingly come before the church board and said that's the case. I have sent so many job applications out and even been on a few job interviews. And those potentials lie before us. And I may have to make some decisions on those based next week. And so this is why today is the most important meeting, because we need to make a decision today as a body and as a church. It's not about my salary, it's about the cost of the church. Me not going without is not the option. It's not the right option because the right option is to give us as a body of believers the understanding that we need to meet the cost. This is, like any other bill, our bill. Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh could have stayed where they were, but they knew that they needed to cross over and fight. You may say, but I only come on a Sunday morning. What do I really access in all of those things? Well, it's not really about you. It's about whatever we do. And if you are a part of this body, then you want to be a part of that body. Now, you might be wondering, why do I take my shoes and socks off and come out in a dressing gown? We've debated this issue for some time. The things don't make sense. As a church, so many people here are committed to the things that go on in the church in so many different ways. So it's not that in this room is a group of people who are in act, who don't care, who are self-centered, who don't want to. To an extent, I believe part of the issue is we have not yet called grace home. It's a waypoint. It's a stopping off place. Who here was born in Blackburn? I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Blackburn or Darwin, we'll go for Darwin as well. That actually is less probably than 15, 20% of our church. Now we can say on one side, we really need to reach out to people in Blackburn a bit better. But the fact is, if I asked who lives in Blackburn, that would be a different list of hands that go up. Because it's not about who was born here, it's about who lives here, it's about who's a part of it. And God has called us all here from very many different places. Are you on your way to somewhere else? Or have you found where you are? The worthless men went to David at Adullam. And if they'd have left there, they'd have carried on to wherever they went and they would have still been worthless men. But when they stayed with David, when they called it their home, when they turned it into a fortress which others who were fleeing injustice and needed peace and safety, justice and mercy, it became a fortress and they left mighty men. God has called you to be mighty men and women. He has called this to be our place. So, here's what we need. And I hate putting people on the spot in any way, but we are, I'm afraid now, after nine months, at our last decision-making point. About a month ago, I asked and explain to you why it was we were planting churches and where our vision leads. I asked you if you were for it, stand with us. And mostly everybody stood. Now comes the challenge that has a cost. That cost is £56,000 for now. We don't make over-expensive judgments. We only make costs on things that we can afford. Therefore, we require 
you to consider the possibility of raising your tithes that you give on a monthly basis by £25. I won't say just £25. For some people, £25 is two takeaways. For other people, that's your food money this month. So some of you can't. Because I believe that tithes and offerings don't come from the purpose of the law. They come out of the excess that God blesses us with. Hence, why the men's group have called for a time of prayer and fasting that we might see that excess so that we can give. But either way, the cost of our church is still that. So we're looking for you to be able to stand with us and say, I'm going to increase, not just for a month, not just for two, but continually what I give to the church in. And I want to increase it by £25 or more. For some of you, that may be tithing for the first time. For some of you, it may be adding more. Those of you who are married, that's £50. Those of you that couldn't ever need or come anywhere near affording £25, some of us may need to meet that need for them. So we've asked, and Linda's got some, she's going to go around and just give you some pledge forms. Because at the end of this meeting, we need to actually have something. Now these pledge forms are not in any way a legal contract. It's between you and the Lord. There is a thing that says signature, but please, you don't have to put your name on it in any way, shape, or form. We have to make a decision today. The decision is this. If I continue in employment with the church or not, because I can't go month by month, are we, are we not going to, are we, are we not going to, I have to make a decision based on that so that we can run where we are as a church. And so it's for us all to stand together. I'm aware that we've well gone over the meeting time, but this is the excess bit. You need to start seeing this is your home. You start seeing this as the place that God has called you to. And in all aspects, that's what we're looking for. So as you get them, and as pens go around, and so on and so forth, we just want to make that statement to see if we can raise that extra £1,000 a month. And if we can, then I make a commitment to you. I will trust you in that, and I will not accept the job offers that are being sent to me this way. And I will remain full-time minister here at the church. That is your choice today, where we are. It is my choice not to sack anybody else or to reduce any other. You could say, you silly fool, that's what you should be doing. I don't want to do that. So I will take the hit. So this is for us all, for us all to consider. This is your home. Let it be your home. This is at cost. Let us meet the cost together. Let's stop praying for a millionaire. And let's start realizing God has called each one of us here for this reason. And if you can't give £25 extra, you can't give anything at all, then understand that. You give from the excess that God has given to you, and that's fine. The last thing to add to you is this. At this moment in time, if you were a taxpayer, either in your job or in your pension, we can claim from the government 25 pence off every pound that you give if you pay tax. If you don't pay tax, then we can't. If you are interested in doing that, then please see Linda. Put your hand up, Linda. She has some forms that you would need to fill out. Nobody gets to know what you're giving. It's all done through a number. But it does mean that if you gave £20, the government would give the other five. But you have to be a taxpayer. If you're not a taxpayer, please don't try and fill that out, or you will get a letter from the tax office telling them you owe them money. (laughs) And then you'll come and tell me I owe you money. There we go. Can we all just stand for a moment? And I wonder if you just hold the hand of the person next to you, and if you're not near anybody, go and find somebody. And we're going to pray together as a group, because we stand and we fall as a group. And it's as simple as that. We come and we stand together. Everything we do, we do together. Every part of this church is a collaboration. Father, I thank you for this wonderful group of people. And I pray, Lord, 
that right now, Lord, that you do bless them and you do encourage them. That you keep calling them, Lord, and they keep finding those good works that you've got them. That, Lord, we walk obedient to your spirit. And that, Lord, you help us to meet this need together. But most importantly, Father, you are in the middle of all that we do. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you all. If you could, have you got a bucket? If you could all, quick, 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 get a bucket. If you could just come and give your form here at the front to Linda, and then please get a tea and coffee. Like the love of the Lord, it's entirely free.